Okay, good afternoon, everybody. And um, we're going to, today we're going to complete our uh, section on uh, metabolism. Um, and then you're going to proceed, please, to do the exercise that um, I asked you to do. Um, and that is on the exercise on photosynthesis, which comprises part of today's class. Okay, so we've talked extensively now about uh, catab catabolic reactions, which are the re reactions of breaking down fuels, the molecules of fuel, like glucose, etc., in order to extract energy, which we put into uh, a useful biological form, which was ATP, which then goes to fund those biological reactions, which are endergonic, which require an input of energy. Those are all the synthetic reactions. And so we naturally, we're going, we need to con at least consider how those, some of those synthetic reactions feed in to what we have already talked about. Because these two things play off against one. Catabolic and anabolic reactions play off against one another in the cell the whole time. And it is that interplay which gives the cell its living character. In, in the living system, these things never reach equilibrium where everything stops. Instead, there's a continual interplay between the two that only ends when the organism dies and all of that interplay is lost. So before we talk about anabolic reactions, about the reactions of synthesis, I just want to mention, because it becomes very important in talking about anabolism, I just want to mention two um, other pathways which um, bear a strong similarity in many ways to glycolysis. We're not going to discuss them in great detail, but you'll see the reason why I want to mention them. These um, are commonly occur in, uh, in prokaryotes, and they may also occur in some eukaryotes as well, but they don't necessarily occur in all prokaryotes, and they can be also be used as distinguishing features between different prokaryotes. The first pathway to mention is called the pentose phosphate pathway. Pentose means five. So this is a, this a pathway where somewhere along the line, a five carbon sugar, it becomes involved. And for this reason, the, you re remember that we actually, in glycolysis and the other reactions, we actually stripped off carbons, right? Well, uh, something a, a little bit similar can happen in the pentose phosphate pathway. The pentose phosphate pathway actually utilizes the first um, enzyme of the glycolysis. And it utilizes this substance, glucose 6 phosphate which is the first, and if you go back to glycolysis, you'll see it's the first intermediate substance, the intermediate substrate. And this pentose phosphate pathway now abstracts this glucose 6-phosphate, takes it off into another pathway, and it produces not NADH as we did from glycolysis before, NADH and ATP. Instead, it produces this substance, NADPH, which is also an electron carrier, and we've heard about it. We've heard about it several times in actual fact. It's not, a, in, it's not as commonly used in cellular respiration as it is in photosynthesis. Nonetheless, it does occur in the cell and it is used in the cell. And here it is specifically produced in the pentose phosphate pathway. And it is shunted off and is used especially for synthesis reactions, for anabolic reactions, to create nucleotides and amino acids. That's of singular importance of this uh, pathway. Although the pentose phosphate pathway can also run in parallel with, with uh, glycolysis and end up from, to much the same products in the end. But is more commonly, it abstracts this intermediate and shunts it off to synthesis reactions for nucleotides and amino acids. The other um, pathway to consider is one called the Entner 
Duderoff pathway, which is very, very similar to glycolysis in many ways, runs almost all the way through uh, the, the glycolysis reactions till it gets to fructose, and then, then it deviates from. Um, it's believed, in fact, that the Entner Duderoff pathway may have been the first pathway to have evolved, and the glycolysis, as we recognize it now, evolved from the Entner Duderoff. But the, the Entner Duderoff pathway produces, also produces NADPH and ATP, and it also produces pyruvic acid. So it's very similar to glycolysis, but it operates completely independently of glycolysis, and it is used principally for the uh, production of amino acids. So it, it, the, it, especially this NADPH is shunted off to produce amino acids as the cell needs them. Again, the Entner Duderoff pathway, this is something which doesn't occur in all prokaryotes. And so it can be used as a discriminatory testing for it, can be used as a discriminatory test. Um, between different organisms. Here are some organisms with uh, really, these are really famous names in prokaryote science. Pseudomonas, Rhizobium, Agrobacterium. These typically have maintained the Entner Duderoff pathway. In a minute, you're going to see why I've drawn your attention to these. Okay, we're not going to discuss the, the uh, synthesis pathways in great detail. They are extremely complex. If you're interested in them and want to study it further on, on you get a biochemical, biochemistry textbook and it will explain them in more detail to you. I'm only going to refer to them, the overall uh, take home from each of these. Okay, so what we can synthesize many, all of the bio, great biomolecules right, in, the, in the cell. Um, and so let's first of all have a look at polysaccharides. And you see that um, these uh, pathways that we've talked about, the uh, glycolysis especially, has lots of intermediates. It has lots of intermediate products. And those intermediate products are extremely useful to the cell. The, the cell may run glycolysis not only to end up with pyruvic acid at the end, but also to produce stores of these intermediates which get shunted off into synthetic pathways. So these pathways all become linked together. Both the catabolic and the anabolic become linked in this way. In the synthesis, biosynthesis of polysaccharides, have a look and you'll see that there are two places in the black colytic pathway where an intermediate can be used for synthesis of, bio, of polysaccharides. Glucose 6-phosphate, we've already heard about one I've just mentioned, um, and that was especially the pentose phosphate pathway. You could abstract that. Um, the, the other intermediate that is used is fructose 6-phosphate. Now these are taken off to, into synthetic reactions, first of all to produce glycogen in, don't worry about these, about the mechanisms of it. Just remember about the final fate. Glucose 6-phosphate is used to synthesize glycogen <laughs> in both animals and in prokaryotes. Fructose 6-phosphate is used to synthesize that substance, peptidoglycan. Peptidoglycan is that very strong polysaccharide molecule which is used to build the cell wall of bacteria and is used by taking off the fructose phosphate from the glycolytic pathways and using it in, in the synthetic pathway. The lipids are also synthesized by the cell. They're not necessarily just acquired from outside. Some of them are, especially the fatty acids, but the um, cell is able to synthesize many of the lipids that it needs and that lipid synthesis uh, uh, is complex process in eukaryotes often takes place at the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Um, again, we will see that the, 
um, product intermediate products of our of our pathways are going to be abstracted off and used for the synthetic first of all this intermediate glyceraldehyde three phosphate you've heard about it i didn't ex expect you necessarily to remember the name but glyceraldehyde three phosphate is one of the intermediates in glycolysis it's taken off used to synthesize glycerol the name tells you that there's some relationship between them is used to synthesize glycerol and acetyl coenzyme a which was the intermediate which was fed into the krebs cycle remember it was a two carbon uh, product which was united with coenzyme a that has strong resemblance to fatty acids and that can be easily synthesized into fatty acids. So take off acetyl coenzyme A there, take off glycerol there, and what um, we can put them together and begin to synthesize simple lipids and simple fats as well, glycerol and glycerol and fatty acids. The synthesis of amino acids utilizes can utilize both the pentose phosphate pathway and the enthnodudorov pathway. So these, again, they have strong similarities to glycolysis, but intermediates of these, and especially the product NADPH, are taken off and uh, are used to synthesize amino acids. They also use, by the way, utilize uh, intermediates of the Krebs cycle they get uh, aminated to, to form the amino acids. Purines and pyrimidines, again, we utilize um, especially the pentose phosphate and enthnodudorov pathways. And uh, they, never mind about all of these, it, they are extremely complex pathways, which lead to the synthesis of uh, purines and pyrimidines the nucleotides which make go to make up the nucleic acids just remember they abstract glucose 6-phosphate here and some other uh, some other products um, of glycolysis shunt them through these pathways and end up producing all of the uh, all of the purines and pyrimidines they can also by the way uh, is from using this me these mechanisms they can also synthesize some of the amino acids. This can be also be used in, to form amino acids. Okay, so that is all we got, just the very broadest outline of the synthetic pathways. And the, the main take home message from all of that is that these, there are several alternative pathways. There are ways of abstracting uh, intermediates pushing them through synthetic pathways and these things feed in to the catalytic pathways, linking catalytic and, uh, uh, sorry, catabolic and anabolic pathways together. One of the things that you begin to realize is, especially in the prokaryotes, is that there is an enormous diversity of uh, ways in which these organisms gain their nutrition. It is an enormous variety of ways in which they gain both matter and energy. And we recognize different, these different groups within the prokaryotes, um, in fact, in all organisms, um, that we can classify them by how they acquire both matter and energy. All living things require a, a source of energy they also require a source of matter. And the, as we have said several times, matter on the, in the biosphere is uh, recycled the whole time, but we require a continual input of energy because all of our energy transformations are inefficient and we lose energy the whole time due to heat. There are two major sources of energy for, for living things. And um, the, the first is that uh, some living things are able to utilize light um, and convert light into 
uh, chemical into the energy of chemical bonds and hence create uh, potential energy in chemical bonds. Those are the those are the organisms which we've talked about that perform actions like photosynthesis. So these we refer to as the phototrophs. Now the phototrophs can be divided into two groups. There's one group which we haven't talked about at all, and I will only just mention so that you know that they exist. The other group we've talked about extensively. We distinguish them by their carbon source. In other words, the, the source of their organic matter. Right? The, 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 the first group is the group that we know best, and that these are those organisms which use light to fix carbon dioxide into organic molecules, which they can then use and which all other living things can then use after them. Those are the photoautotrophs. An autotroph is something which uses carbon dioxide as its source of carbon, and it uses light in order to bond the carbon molecules together. And in the same, at the same time, bond oxygen and hydrogen to them. But essentially what it's doing is bonding carbons together to form uh, longer carbon compounds. The photoautotrophs use light and carbon dioxide, but they also have different sources of, um, of reducing power. Let's put it, I'll say it like that. When they could take carbons and they join them together, what they're actually wanting to do at the same time is bond hydrogen suit. They want to reduce the carbon with hydrogen. And there are different sources of hydrogen and that, that they can that can be used. The obvious source of, of hydrogen is the one that we have talked about, which is water. And uh, so here we have uh, phototrophs, which are using carbon dioxide as their carbon source. They're using light, so they are photoautotrophs. But there is one group which uses water as its source of hydrogen. That's the one that we've talked about. If you take off hydrogen from water in order to bond it to the carbons, you're left with oxygen. You generate oxygen. So these are called the oxygenic, this is called oxygenic photosynthesis. And these are oxygenic photosynthesizers, oxygenic photoautotrophs. There are other sources of hydrogen, however. For example, there are some microorganisms which can make use of hydrogen sulfide, H2S, still H2, but it's what are they going to be left with? They're going to be left with sulfur, not oxygen, but they'll be left with sulfur as the waste product. So those are anoxygenic. They're not generating oxygen. Those are the anoxygenic photosynthetic bacteria. Never mind about the names. Just remember that they actually exist. Okay. There are some microorganisms which are photoautotrophs, which use other sources of hydrogen to reduce the carbon, to produce their organic molecules. Those are our photoautotrophs. Now let's move, let's come across here because there's many organisms which cannot use light as, as a source of energy. They cannot use, convert light into chemical bonds. Instead, they're going to depend, uh, they have to have some other source of energy. And these uh, organisms all depend upon substances which contain energy in one form or another. And because they rely on substances, on already created molecules, which contain energy in one form or another, these we call the chemotrophs. We are chemotrophs. Okay. We, depend upon, we depend upon molecules which have already been created with their energy and the molecules that we are going to use. So we are chemotropes. We're using them principally as a source of energy, but we also use them as a again, we also use them as a source of carbon and all of our other 
all of our other elements. So that we got the chemotropes. Now we've got to think that in fact, carbon, carbon dioxide is still out there as a potential source of carbon. Let's think about our group for a start because it's the easiest. We can't use carbon dioxide, right? You breathe in carbon dioxide if you want to, nothing, your body can't make use of it in any useful form. We breathe it out as a waste product of our respiratory processes from the breakdown of fuel. We can't use it. Instead, we are absolutely dependent on using organic compounds, which have already been created originally by the plants as a source, both of energy and of carbon. We depend on already created molecules, carbon molecules as a source of carbon. And because of that, the, because we depend upon organic, we are referred to as chemo heterotrophs. We are chemotropes, but we're chemo heterotrophs because we depend upon already created molecules. There are various groups of chemo heterotrophs. Um, I'm, I'm just going to tell you, first of all, that um, we're, we, we will simply divide them into two groups. Those which use oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor and those which do not. Okay, we're going to divide our groups, in other words, into aerobes, either obligate or facultative, and the obligate anaerobes. All chemoheterotrophs, okay. In this case, we use oxygen as our terminal electron acceptor. That's why we breathe out uh, water from our respiratory processes. Okay. I, I told you that before. All animals, uh, most fungi, um, there, there are fungi that they can function anaerobically, but most, fun, most fungi. And bacteria, most bacteria that are capable of using oxygen, et cetera, et cetera. All of those groups are chemoheterotrophs and they all utilize oxygen. There are groups which, which use um, other substances other than oxygen as terminal electron acceptors. And uh, these are various, these various other groups of obligate anaerobes that may use, uh, that, that use some other substance. We're not going to discuss it in any detail. Just remember that there are these two groups distinguished by their final, their final electron acceptors. There's this other group though, very, very important group, especially in the prokaryotes. We depend upon organic compounds. All of this, this entire group here depends upon organic compounds for their carbon source and for their energy. This group here are actually able to utilize carbon dioxide. They can take fixed carbon dioxide and they can build it into organic compounds. It sounds very much like what happened here. The difference is that they're not using light as a source of, of energy. Instead, they utilize inorganic compounds as a source of energy. Very often, for example, they will use hydrogen sulfide or something like this. They will use various other compounds. You can see here, there's a whole list of them. They can take an inorganic substance, break it, and utilize the energy in, in the bonds to actually drive the processes which will convert, which will fix carbon dioxide and produce organic molecules. They are also autotrophs, in other words. They are autotrophs. They use carbon dioxide and hydrogen in order to create organic molecules. But they are using the, instead of using light, as a source of energy, they are using the energy inherent in chemical bonds in inorganic molecules. So they are called chemo autotrophs and they are extremely diverse, very, very important environmentally because they are, they are often responsible for the recycling of compounds, of elements into the biosphere. 
as they break these molecules continuously, they end up recycling the elements back into the biosphere right? and creating many different uh, compounds in the process, which may be very important. For example, methane is one of the compounds which arises from processes like this. We're not going to discuss it in any more detail than that. But I want you please to be able to distinguish between chemoheterotrophs, chemoautotrophs, photoheterotrophs, which we only just mentioned, and photoautotrophs. Okay. Be able to distinguish between these and then remember these distinctions here, whether or not they use water to reduce carbon dioxide, whether or not they use oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor, and whether or not they use light or a chemical bond as the source of energy to fix carbon dioxide. Okay, this basically just explains to you. Um, this is, uh, the table gives you a good summary of the different uh, metabolic diversity types, photoautotrophs, photoheterotrophs, chemoautotrophs, and chemoheterotrophs. And um, be, be able to distinguish between them. Um, I, you don't need to know names of the, the bacteria, okay? Just know that these, that these in fact do exist. Okay, so uh, with that, I'm complete uh, today's class because I want you now to please proceed to do this interactive exercise. And remember, please to do this carefully. It need be repeated several times until it is absolutely clear to you. Um, this, and because this is actually examinable. Okay, and I will then I will see you again next week, on Wednesday next week.